you know, the tie that binds that we're hearing is metabolism. We all speak the same language, but we do work in our own silos. Now we're going to turn to my silo of many years, the diabetes world, which I am very proud to present a, a, a longtime friend and dear colleague, Jay Schuyler. Jay needs no introduction in the diabetes world, but for those who need to, who don't know Jay, he is really a rock star in our field. He's not just an expert on the practice and investigation of type 1 and type 2 diabetes, but equally important, he has been a founder, a, a builder, and a, a teacher in the infrastructure of diabetes research and development. So Jay, thank you for attracting this stellar panel, and I can't wait to hear it. Thanks, Ann. And uh, we do have a, a great panel. Um, if uh, we could turn our videos on, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Jerry Schulman. Uh, Jerry is uh, from Yale University, uh, where he is the um, uh, George R. Cogwell Professor of Medicine, as well as Professor of Cellular and Molecular uh, Physiology and co-director of the Yale Diabetes Center. Uh, I also have uh, Alyssa uh, Hasty here. Alyssa is the Cornelius Vanderbilt, I guess he is the guy who started it, um, a professor of uh, molecular physiology and biophysics at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. Uh, and uh, we hope to have on, on the panel as well, Ralph DeFranzo from uh, the University of Texas in San Antonio. And I hope he didn't confuse the the times because he's on central time zone, but we'll go ahead and start um, uh, at the moment. And uh, perhaps some uh, introductory remarks are, are helpful. And uh, uh, Jerry, why don't you start? Oh, sure. Uh, Jay, thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. And it's good to see you with us up. Look forward to our discussions. Um, well, I'm sure Ralph will show up eventually. Um, so, you know, work that we've done, you know, is wonderful listening to the previous um, uh, panel discussion about cancer. And I, I believe, you know, one of the reasons that we're seeing these, this increase in cancer um, um, uh, prevalence uh, is this, again, this well-established association with obesity. And really what's driving in my mind is insulin resistance. And that's what I study. And that's what I hope you can talk about uh, during the session. Insulin resistance is clearly, um, you know, linked to uh, breast cancer, colon cancer, uh, uterine cancer, and many, many others. And in fact, there's very good preclinical evidence from our lab and others that if you reverse insulin re resistance, you can slow down uh, tumor growth of certainly breast cancer and two forms of colon cancer. So understanding insulin resistance, um, uh, there's Ralph. Um, in understanding insulin resistance, if we can understand the molecular basis for insulin resistance, I think not only will we uh, be able to impact metabolic disease, diabetes, uh, uh, certainly heart disease, which is the leading killer uh, in, in uh, this country and uh, westernized countries, but also probably impact many other things such as even uh, these uh, obesity associated cancers. Um, if I may, Jay, do you want to hear about work that we're doing to understand the, the basis for insulin resistance? And I don't know if we can get into slides at this point or? Uh, yeah, we, uh, uh, they, the, the uh, conference administrator should have your slides. And oh, be able excellent. To, so, to put so, in and, so and, and I think great, it's important you. that you mentioned that uh, these are mechanisms which are responsible for diabetes, obesity, NASH, coronary disease, and as you pointed out, even some forms of cancer. It's, it's, germane all across. Absolutely. So to me, this is it. You know, if we can understand, you know, and, and again, Ralph, we're going to hear a lot from Ralph about this, but if we can understand the molecular basis for insulin resistance, we're going to have great impact on all of these diseases. So this is what my lab has been focused on the last uh, three decades. And we've been using a technique called nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy to interrogate intracellular metabolism, because if you, you can actually get in there and understand where uh, glucose goes or doesn't go, then you can actually understand the molecular basis for insulin resistance. And you know, let me let me just add to that. Where you know, again, this is this is a this is to me the sixty-four thousand dollar question we're all struggling with. And every drug, just about without exception, there may be one uh, that does it. 
is we're treating the symptom of diabetes. We're treating glucose, lowering glucose. We're not really getting at insulin resistance. The TZDs do this to some extent, which I'll get into that uh, mechanism. So yeah, you, I was only allowed, I think, five slides. So um, I heard the previous panel discussion. There are many more, and I was kind of saying, oh boy, maybe I don't have enough. But I'm only going to go through five slides because I want to basically set the stage for uh, Ralph and Melissa. But this is my view of, I want to start with the physiological, how I view the physiological um, uh, uh, cause for insulin resistance. And it's all going to be related to ectopic fat, where fat uh, should be and shouldn't be. And then two slides on just the molecular basis for insulin resistance, because I think this will, uh, uh, this will guide us to new uh, therapies that actually get at the root cause of insulin resistance. So, you know, as studies that Ralph and others have done, and, and again, a lot of this uh, I learned, I had the fortune of working with Ralph when uh, he was at Yale, have taught us that insulin resistance, the two key insulin responsive organs, of course, are, are liver and skeletal muscle. And, but, um, and what's been driving the insulin resistance work that we've done using NMR spectroscopy has really shown us that in skeletal muscle shown in the bottom, it's basically um, the inability of insulin to stimulate uh, glucose incorporation to glycogen. And, and using phosphorus NMR, we were able to show the, the block was a transport phosphorylation. We developed a car method to measure glucose inside the muscle and showed that it was transport. So this is the rate controlling step uh, in uh, causing insulin resistance and type two diabetes in muscle. And if we can then identify, this would be say that this is now the target if you wanna fix insulin resistance in muscle, it's, it's transport. Studies that we then got, went, on to under, went on to try to understand what's wrong with the insulin activation of transport led us to the world of lipids. And we were able to then show measure using uh, proton NMR that it was ectopic lipid, it was lipid inside the muscle that was the best predictor for insulin resistance in virtually all populations we've looked at. We did this in young people, did this in the elderly, we did this, did this in children. In sedentary individuals, the more ectopic lipid, that is fat, inside the myocyte, the more insulin resistant they were, this, this, these, these individuals are. And then um, going on, to understand what the, the molecular basis for that uh, uh, lipid induced insulin resistance led us to identify, do lipidomics and identify diacylglycerol specifically in the plasma membrane that activates novel protein kinases that Im impact uh, insulin action. And I'll get into this in my, my last uh, two slides. So, so that, and it's the same thing in liver. So when fat builds up in liver, it often leads to liver insulin resistance. This is why virtually fatty liver, which is now becoming uh, uh, one in three Americans suffer from fatty liver. It's gonna be the leading cause, metabolic liver disease, leading cause of NASH, liver cirrhosis, uh, end stage liver disease, liver cancer. Uh, again, related to fat in the, the uh, liver cell, and I'll get into the molecular basis for that. So, I first now want to then give a big physiological view. So fat is the problem, too much fat where it doesn't belong inside liver and muscle cells. And there are many ways of getting there. So this is my overview. So I can go to the next slide. This, um, you can basically, we all know that again, this relationship with obesity over the last 50 years and insulin resistance, our genes haven't changed. What has changed is our environment and this increased prevalence of obesity. So no matter what your genetic makeup is, if we can all eat our way to insulin resistance by simply taking in more calories than we burn, that leads, next slide, to ectopic lipid in liver and muscle because you overwhelm the ability to store the fat in the fat cell. And this is a good place to store the fat, even though we may not like it. Um, if you store your fat uh, and it's in this inert place, the fat cell, this is a good place to do it, but you can overwhelm the ability of the fat cell to store this energy, and it spills over to liver and muscle. And that's why virtually every obese uh, adult or child that we study has ectopic fat in liver and muscle and are insulin resistant. And we've done studies when we reverse uh, uh, weight loss and other things, get rid of the fat in liver and muscle, we can reverse the insulin resistance and the diabetes. Next slide. Now, having said um, that, you know, again, we know this well-established relationship between obesity and diabetes has been known for, for decades. It's the, flip experiment, the flip side is also equally important in terms of understanding mechanisms of insulin resistance. And those lessons are taught to us by patients uh, and animal models that have no fat. 
And this was a real shock to people because we've always associated obesity with insulin resistance. And studies that we and others have shown in humans with no fat, lipodystrophy or lipoatrophy and mouse models, they have no fat. And the reason they're so insulin resistant is they're nowhere to store the fat, no white adipocytes. So it ends up in liver and muscle cells. And this is why every uh, you know, severe lipodystrophic individual we study or animal models, they have too much fat in liver muscle. And again, the molecular basis for this is these diacylglycerols, actin, and PKCs. And again, we, in mice, you can transplant fat back into them and you lower the ectopic lipid in liver and muscle and you reverse the insulin resistance. So again, we've always associated, the lesson here is obesity with insulin resistance, but many, many people are insulin resistance and not obese, and especially these lipodystrophic. And even our, our HIV patients with partial lipodystrophy, they have the same metabolic problem. They get into issues with the fat cells not behaving properly, not being able to store the fat, it spills over. And more importantly, these lipid uh, uh, mediators, uh, diacylglycerols, activate uh, pathways that block insulin action. Next slide. Um, and, um, and next slide, please. And then, then this concept, and again, I'm, I'm trying to uh, um, give a concept here, also explains how uh, agents work. um are agents that have been used to treat insulin resistance. It's probably the only drug that we have uh, available to treat insulin resistance. And the paradox is always how are they working? And studies by our group and others, um, including Ralph, we've shown TZDs actually in human patients with type 2 diabetes promote the redistribution of this ectopic lipid from liver and muscle to the fat cell. And this explains why they're insulin sensitizing because they're working on the fat cell. It also explains, you know, they improve insulin sensitivity in liver and muscle. And we've shown this and Ralph's group has shown this, but they actually promote then this redistribution, the white adipocytes expand. And that's why our patients, unfortunately, why we may be improving their diabetes they're, um, they actually gain weight, which uh, they're not happy about. And as a, uh, physicians treating them, we're not happy about, but we're saying, okay, that again, at, at least your diabetes, your A1C is under control. Adiponectin, this is unpublished work, but I'll share it with the group, is working through the same way. Adiponectin is a um, uh, adipokine uh, discovered by Harvey Lodish, they'll share in Katawaki in Japan simultaneously. And it's been a big paradox. How does adiponectin work? And so we've shown, and studies that'll be coming out soon, that adiponectin is working just like the TZDs, actually promoting re redistribution of ectopic fat from liver and muscle to the adipocyte. Next slide, please. And then finally, again, this again, it's, it's a question, next slide, please, of thermodynamics. So again, we're, again, consider liver and muscle fat building up into these organ beds, it's energy delivery versus energy uh, uh, oxidation. And the liver can also export the energy. So we talked about energy intake, energy delivered to um, uh, these tissues, either through increased energy intake or um, uh, inability of the fat cell to uh, uh, hold on to this uh, energy. But then there's alterations in mitochondrial function. And in a series of studies, we've shown that when you have with, with aging, next slide, with aging, as we all age, um, our mitochondrial function uh, reduces by about 20 to 30%. And so studies that uh, Kit Peterson, next slide, has shown uh, in healthy aging, all of us, by, we, she, Kit studied healthy 70-year-olds who are lean, compared to healthy lean 20-year-olds, and showed that mitochondrial function was reduced by 20 to 30%. And this predisposes to ectopic fat buildup insulin resistance. And we've been, been able to prove this in mice by preventing mitochondrial dysfunction with aging by targeting catalysts to the mitochondria. And we reverse this phenomena uh, in mice, we reverse the ectopic lipid buildup and the uh, insulin resistance. Next slide. We and others have also shown that, you know, uh, in young lean insulin resistant offspring of parents with type 2 diabetes, this is the group that the Jocelyn has shown as the very high predisposition to developing diabetes, they have reduced function. And again, predisposing them to ectopic fat buildup uh, in muscle insulin resistance. Next slide. And now what's exciting is Joshua Knowles at Stanford has discovered variants, uh, NAT1 variant, 
that leads to inherited reduction, mild inherited reduction in mitochondrial function. And his group and us, our group, has shown when you knock out the mouse homolog, you have mild reductions in mitochondrial function. These mice have a pre, uh, predisposed ectopic fat buildup in liver muscle, insulin resistance in these organs. So that, this is the physiological context I want to build on, and, and I'm sure we'll hear more from Ralph and Alyssa uh, to, uh, on this. So next, that last two slides here just to get to drill down. Oh, and then I just wanted to talk about, I bet there will be variants that actually will speed up the mitochondria, burn fat. And actually, if you're lucky enough to have these variants, you may actually be pre pre protected from lipid induced liver and muscle insulin resistance and diabetes. So I just now wanna drill down to the molecular basis uh, for um, the insulin resistance. Next slide, please. And so I just want to talk about insulin resistance in how I view uh, what's driving insulin resistance in skeletal muscle and liver. Uh, and it's basically doing partial lipidomics, looking at ceramides, diisoglycerols, and, and other uh, uh, bioactive intermediates. We've zeroed in on diisoglycerol. More specifically, in our most recent studies, you have to look at the SN12 isoform, the 1323 don't activate NPKC. And it's specifically the compartment is important. It's in the plasma membrane. So it's the SN12 diisoglycerols in the plasma membrane that are the bioactive, uh, both metabolite and compartment. So next slide. So what happens again, when you have this imbalance between fatty acid delivery to the muscle cell and the ability of that muscle cell to oxidize the fat, you have this imbalance, and then the, the, basically you get net increases in these SN12 diisoglycerols, which we've shown. They go to, go next slide, go to the plasma membrane, um, the next slide, and they activate both PKC theta, which blocks then as a serine kinase cascade, blocks IRS1 phosphorylation, next slide, and we've also shown that and, uh, PKC epsilon activation, and both of these then block insulin signaling and block GLUT4 translocation, which remember from my first slide, is the rate controlling step for getting glucose into muscle glycogen. I wanna make a very, another very important point here is triglyceride, diaso, tri, tags, triglycerides are inert. And so even though fat, a lot of people have the fat in the muscle, that's just a marker. It's like ceramides, it's inert. It's really not causing the insulin resistance. It's a marker really for the bioactive uh, molecule of diisoglycerols. And we've shown now a similar pathway is happening in white adipocyte. This is unpublished work, but it's going to be DAG, PKC, epsilon, blocking insulin action in white adipocyte to explain that. And then finally, the liver, again, this is, again, if I had to pick one organ to, to target, next slide, to, um, to target for type 2 diabetes, my first target would be liver, next slide. Next slide. Yeah, here we go. And first, okay, first I want to just say how I believe insulin works on the liver. And the liver, again, in terms of glucose metabolism, makes glucose or actually metabolizes glucose. And there are two important processes in terms of glucose metabolism, and that is glycogen synthesis and gluconeogenesis. And uh, I don't have enough time to get into all the details, but we have to be don't thinking- don't have much about, time at all because we've used up half of the hour already, so. Well, okay, okay. I'm just gonna basically say there's two things. Uh, there's the direct effect and indirect effect. The direct effect is insulin affecting glycogen synthesis. The indirect effect is really working on the fat cell, nothing to do with the liver, to suppress lipolysis, and that then allosterically next slide regulates gluconeogenesis through acetyl-CoA. And then finally, and this I think is gonna take us into Alyssa's work, next slide, keep going, you can march through this. And what happens in diabetes then, in terms of next slide, this is my last one, next please, is this is what's dysregulated in diabetes, where again, next slide, where lipid builds up, diisoglycerols go to the plasma membrane, this we just published this month in cell metabolism, this, activates epsilon. This inhibits the receptor directly through three phosphorylation, next slide, of 1160. That blocks glycogen synthesis. And then, keep going, next slide. And then inflammation in the white adipocyte. So again, we've shown that macrophage activation leads IL-6, tnf alpha, and I think what we're gonna hear from Melissa with iron, this promotes uh, inflammation, more lipolysis, more fatty acid delivery to liver, acetyl-CoA goes up, and activates pervic carboxylase stimulating gluconeogenesis. 
And finally, if this is correct, these are the two bad actors in liver, diacylglycerols, SM12, and acetyl-CoA. And this is what I want to target. I want to revert, reduce these metabolites to fix it. And one way we're doing that is liver-targeted mitochondrial coupling. Uh, and that's all I have to say for now. Thank you. Okay. Well, you've, uh, you've mentioned Alyssa. Why don't we go right on to Alyssa and hear her uh, comments? Sure. So thank you so much. I, I wanted to thank Zen for the inv in invitation to be on this panel. And it's really a pleasure to be here with Jay and Jerry and Ralph. So my work actually focuses on immunometabolism, which in primarily we look at the immune cells in adipose tissue and how the inflammatory state of adipose tissue in obesity can actually induce insulin resistance and also that ectopic lipid storage that Jerry was mentioning. And we, we define immunometabolism in two different ways, extrinsic versus intrinsic. So extrinsic would be the immune cells that infiltrate the adipose tissue and induce inflammation via secreted cytokines and things like that, and, and thereby influence the surrounding adipocytes in the adipose tissue. And this, this um, pathway could be modulated in, in various ways. First of all, adaptive uh, or innate immune cells like neutrophils, macrophages, and dendritic cells are increased in obese adipose tissue. And so reducing their, their recruitment to adipose tissue and in their inflammatory status could be one way to think about um, impinging upon the inflammation in adipose tissue. But adaptive immune cells also enter adipose tissue. So cells like T cells and B cells. And I just wanna let that sink in for a minute because that's implying that there's antigen presentation going on in adipose tissue. And why in the world would that be? That's something that's so intriguing to me and others in our field is thinking about why these immune cells are in the adipose tissue. But it lends to the thought that blocking antigen presentation or modulating checkpoint co-inhibitors or targeting MHC2 interactions between um, antigen presenting cells and, and, and the T cells might be other ways to think about um, putting a stop to this inflammatory status of obese adipose tissue. There's something else that I wanted to highlight that may be less well known to this group, which is that weight loss doesn't actually correct the immune phenotype of the fat. So individuals like Willa Shua and Carrie Luming have published on this already. And, and my lab has some data also that the immune phenotype of the adipose tissue, even after, after weight regulation for many, many, many weeks in animals, in mouse models, models does not, is not corrected. And the reason we think that's relevant is because weight cycling, which most humans do gaining and losing and gaining and losing weight throughout our lives, actually increases risk of cardiometabolic disease, cognitive decline and death. So we think that there, this residual inflammation in adipose tissue and potentially in, in other organs in the body may be really important for why weight cycling over the course of a, of a lifetime can be increasing disease. So I'll move on to intrinsic immunometabolism, which actually is, the, is how immune cells utilize fuels. And, and Jerry talked about glucose utilization. So in the, this field of intrinsic immunometabolism is really most well defined and was initiated in the cancer field. But my group and others are becoming interested in how thinking about the immune, uh, about the fuel utilization of immune cells in tissues like the adipose tissue or the liver or the brain, how that influences their behavior within that tissue and whether we could actually take advantage of the fact that we know that more inflammatory type cells utilize fatty acid oxidation and oxidative phosphorylation, whereas um, the, the anti-inflammatory cells, excuse me, use those pathways, whereas the more pro inflammatory cells use glycolysis, that, that we might be able to capitalize on those pathways in terms of targeting inflammatory pathways leading to insulin resistance. So with, I, I just want to end on something else that may be less well thought about in this audience, which is that there's also a really strong link between iron and metabolic disease. So this has been known for many, many decades. The field initially just made this discovery in genetic diseases of iron overload, like hereditary hemochromatosis, as well as transfusional iron overload. And in fact, 
early on, up to 80% of people with hereditary hemochromatosis presented with diabetes, and it was called bronze diabetes. And since that time, we know that even in cases of non-hereditary forms of iron overload, that there's up to a 3.6 uh, increased uh, odds ratio increased of serum ferritin, which is a measure of tissue iron in women to have diabetes, and it's almost 5% in men. So serum ferritin is something that's often measured as an indicator of tissue iron and is clearly linked with metabolic diseases such as obesity, metabolic syndrome, PCOS, hepatic steatosis, and neurodegenerative diseases. So brain, brain iron overload is associated with Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. So in this conference talking about vital aging, I think that it is important for us to also consider the role that iron might have. And it's strongly associated also with inflammation and there's not time to get into all of the elements of that relationship, but I thought it would be something worth um, bringing forward into this conversation. And with that, I will, I guess, um, let our moderator um, bring out our, our next guest, but I was happy to be able to tell you some of the work that we're doing in my lab. Great. Ralph, uh, Jerry's covered a lot of things that you're interested in, too. Do you have uh, something specific you want to add to that? First, uh, uh, I would agree with it, really all of the concepts that uh, Jerry uh, put uh, forward. Uh, so I think, obviously, what's driving the epidemic of diabetes is the epidemic of obesity. This is the epidemic of fat overload. And I think Jerry and then also Alyssa have given you some very good uh, insights. But I, I will, I'm going to move a little bit away from the insulin resistance uh, because I personally believe, and probably Jerry does too, that this is what starts the problem. Uh, but you actually don't develop diabetes unless your beta cells fail. Uh, so uh, it's important, I think, uh, to correct both of these uh, problems. Now, having said that, uh, do we have drugs uh, currently available that will actually correct the insulin resistance and also work on the beta cell. And in fact, we do have one, and that is pioglitazone. Uh, Jerry mentioned this, and in fact, uh, Jerry and I did a study together. Uh, Jerry actually made the intracellular, intramyocellular lipid uh, measurements, and uh, what we showed in that study was in fact that there was a decrease uh, in diacylglycerol and fatty acyl-CoAs, which correlated very strongly with the improvement in insulin sensitivity. But what people don't recognize is that there's also lipid deposition in the beta cells. And one of the things that pioglitazone does is to actually mobilize this fat out of the beta cells. And other than the GLP-1 receptor agonist, uh, the only other drug that has this big effect on the beta cell to improve beta cell function are uh, the TZDs. Uh, and we also know that this fat story also extends over into the arterial system. So you talk to cardiologists and they'll tell you everything about LDL cholesterol, but if you ask them, you know, what about fatty acids? They have no idea what fatty acid even looks like. So if you go back to the 1940s, where people were not very sophisticated and they just took plaque and ground it up, the most common lipid in the plaque are free fatty acids. Uh, and I believe that one of the major benefits of pioglitazone is to mobilize fat out of the arteries. And it's pretty well established now that, uh, that uh, TZDs actually are cardioprotective in terms of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And we know from the IRIS study uh, that TZDs work in preventing cardiovascular events, recurrent events, in people who are insulin resistant but are non-diabetics. So I think we need to learn more about drugs that will actually uh, do the sort of same thing that uh, uh, pioglitazone does, maybe more effectively. And although people complain about the fat weight gain as a side effect, every single thing that we've done, the more fat you gain, the greater the improvement in beta cell function. The more fat you gain, the greater the improvement in insulin resistance in the muscle. The more fat you gain, the greater the improvement in insulin resistance in the liver. And in fact, that fat deposition in the liver is just the sort of 
uh, metabolic manifestation of the insulin resistance syndrome. And pioglitazone is really the only drug that reverses NASH in NAFL. So we already have some pretty good insights about how to attack the problems that Jerry has been talking about. And it's not surprising to me that you would also get cardiovascular benefit uh, from uh, this. Uh, so I'll stop uh, at this point, since I think now we have all the organs on the table, liver uh, and muscle by Jerry, fat by Alyssa, and now beta cell in the heart, which is an important organ as well. Thanks, Ralph. And we have a few questions that have come in from, from people in the audience. Uh, several of them relate to, to diet. And is there an optimal diet, uh, number one? Uh, and this person suggested potentially ketogenic diet. And number two, are there nutritional supplements that can impact on the disease process? So those are a couple of the questions that have come in, and I'll open it to any of you to try to address uh, that. I'll, I'll give it a shot, okay? Uh, I think if you shut your mouth and you don't put calories in, that is the most important thing. Uh, whether ketogenic diets uh, do something above and beyond just weight loss per se, I think is, in my opinion, very controversial and unknown. And we actually are doing a study now where we're taking overweight type 2 diabetics uh, and we're putting them on uh, a isocaloric ketogenic diet. Uh, and we want to know uh, if without weight loss, if you can increase the ketone level, uh, in the order of two to three millimolar, will there be some specific benefits of the ketogenic diet in the elevation in ketones above and beyond the weight loss? So we, we're doing the, the typical type things that Jerry and I do, measuring insulin sensitivity, beta cell function, et cetera. And I don't believe, or at least I'm not convinced that there's a study out there that really differentiates what the, keto, keep the elevation in ketones per se does independent of the weight loss that usually goes with these diets. I don't know, Jerry or Alyssa may want to uh, comment further. Uh, Ralph, totally, uh, total agreement as usual. I, it's, it's me, I tell my patients, look at the scale. I, to me, whatever works for them is the most important thing. We know if they lose um, um, 10 pounds, they can sometimes reverse their diabetes. Kit Peterson's shown that, and it's been shown by Roy Taylor and many others. Um, so it's really getting the weight down. And again, it's an individual thing. So work with the patient, whatever works for the patient. And then if they, the key thing is to stick to it. So, you know, again, everyone's successful getting weight off and we cheer this. And then uh, six months later, a year later, it's right back to where they were. So it's not only getting the weight down, finding what works, but then maintaining is the most important thing. Um, and again, whether or not there's something magical about ketogenic diet, we, we just last year's published a study with uh, Hanala uh, Yiki Yarvin uh, looking at ketogenic diet. Um, this wasn't isocaloric, but we did, this was basically a hypocaloric ketogenic diet and clearly showed it impacted um, a hepatic redox state, um, glucose alanine cycling, mitochondrial function. So it has some interesting effects. It did lower liver fat um, as has been shown before, but again, in the context of hypo uh, hypocaloric uh, setting. So I think it'll be fascinating, Ralph, to see what you find when you do isocaloric feeding. Uh, Alyssa, yeah. I don't know if you want to comment on diet. And Alyssa, I, uh, one of the uh, questions about diet was specifically directed at you uh, and your opinion on whether uh, uh, we get into trouble because of the high polyunsaturates and the low omega-3s that we consume. That was specifically for me, did you yes. say? So I'm not a I'm not a clinician. So just to to put that out there, but I do think that there is evidence that the omega three fish oils are more health beneficial than saturated fats. I think that that seems pretty clear. Uh, I don't know if you want more of an answer than that, but maybe the maybe the physicians can answer that. Yeah, I'll, I'll help out. Um, so, you know, we've studied, at least in, in rodents, um, you have profound effects. And Storlin has shown this. He was the first one to do fish oil versus uh, a large. And Storlin and his colleagues uh, clearly showed fish oil was beneficial, no insulin resistance, um, mice were better. And, and um, mechanistically, we built on that and showed, yes, when we, we replicated everything Les did, 
but we showed mechanistically, guess what? It's lowering ectopic lipid, it enhances sensitivity of liver and muscle. And these omegas in rodents are pan PPAR activators, and in, in, at least in our hands, it's activating PPAR gamma and PPAR alpha, probably delta, we didn't look at that, but clearly alpha and delta, uh, alpha and gamma. And, uh, and these are well established, certainly gamma, as we just heard, will enhance sensitivity, gets rid of the ectopic fat we showed that NAGs go down in some resistance reverses. Much less potent um, in humans. Humans have much less PPAR alpha act, uh, activity in liver than, than rodents. And more importantly, remember what we did and what Les did in rodents is they replaced into all of the lipid pretty much with menhendrin oil, fish oil. In humans, we give them a few capsules, which is a very, uh, as, as a fraction of uh, you know, 5% of the entire fat um, uh, intake. So what we're doing in rodents uh, is very, very hard to replicate in humans where you have to tell people, patients, uh, take all of your fat and it has to be omega fatty acids. And that's rarely done, maybe in certain places where people just eat fish entirely for their diet, um, uh, you might see this. Um, but so, so I think, you know, clearly, I think studies have shown there is some beneficial effects of some of the omegas. And I think, um, but the, I, I, do, I do think that um, the rodents, that this is where uh, you see a much, much more uh, powerful effect in rodents than, than we see in humans. So near Barzilay wants to know if, if that's the case, hmm. why do animal models who have uh, insulin resistance live longer lifespans than ones who are insulin sensitive? So can, can I take that? And I know Ralph is getting ready, but let me, let me just, you know, so rodents, you know, for aging, and again, it's probably the most popular model because they're inexpensive and, and um, uh, we can follow them. They have a short life of two years. In my view, it's not gonna be a great model for humans because humans die from cardiovascular disease, heart disease, atherosclerosis. Mice don't, they die from things like cancer. So, so, you know, so insulin resistance clearly drives atherosclerosis and we can go through mechanisms um, that we and others, a paper just came out by Sam Klein and this week, months, JCI. But you, if, you, if you basically, um, uh, insulin resistance is going to drive VLDL production by the liver. That's going to raise triglycerides, lower HDL, raise LDL. This is heart disease. Rodents don't do this. Uh, you can genetically modify them, but it's still it's not perfect. And so you reverse insulin resistance and you reverse these effects. Weight loss reverses, improves the lipoprotein uh, profile. Agents that enhance sensitivity, liver target uncoupling will uh, in, enhance the, uh, the lipid protein profile. This is why, again, I think um, we're distracted uh, by studies, insulin resistance in mice uh, versus humans. So, so in my view, you need to stick with the model that matter, not human primates and humans. So those are tough studies to do because they're going to take a long time. So I know Ralph is right. jumping up. Yeah, I, I'm just going to echo exactly what Jerry said. I mean, rodents don't develop atherosclerosis. So you can make them as insulin resistant as you want. They're not gonna die of cardiovascular disease. On the other hand, you make people uh, insulin resistant and for all kinds of reasons, some that Jerry said, but many other we don't have to go into, they develop uh, uh, accelerated cardiovascular disease. So insulin resistance has a very, very different long-term impact in humans than it does in rodents. And I would agree that these models that have been used to look at aging are really not good models to be looking at what goes on with human aging in terms of insulin resistance. Okay, one last question uh, that I'll direct at Ralph. Uh, if you're looking at trying to modify insulin resistance, do SGLT inhibitors do anything? Uh, I would say uh, that indirectly by lowering glucose, they have a small to modest effect to improve insulin sensitivity in uh, the muscle. Uh, very difficult to evaluate what's going on in the liver uh, because there's a paradoxical stimulation of hepatic glucose production, uh, uh, which probably is being uh, mediated by the renal nerves. It's a paper that we just published in uh, Diabetologia. But uh, they do have a small insulin sensitizing effect in the muscle. Uh, related to reversal of glucotoxicity. They have a bigger effect to improve beta cell function, but these drugs are nowhere near what you're gonna get with uh, the TZDs. Okay, 
Well, I want to thank all three panelists for being with us. We're out of time, so I'm going to throw it back to Thomas or Zan or whoever is uh, going to, um, to take over. Actually, Jay, uh, you have until 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern. You have another nine minutes, eight to nine minutes. There are a number of questions in there. Schedule I was in said, 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 said 12.50, so that's why I stopped. But I'm happy to go on if... if uh, it's a great discussion. Uh, please proceed. Uh, there are like a dozen questions, Q&A, and there are other intra-panel topics you might want to discuss. Please. Sure. So uh, the one question uh, for Alyssa is, are M2 macrophages involved in uh, weight loss, weight gain at all? So M2 macrophage, all macrophages increase in adipose tissue and obesity. Primarily there are M1s, but there are also M2s, if you will. And, and really it's the, the field really doesn't like that nomenclature so much that there's really a continuum and a spectrum of macrophages. And in fact, what were previously considered M1s in the fat are really identified more as being metabolically active now and having roles in lipid handling and lipid metabolism. But these anti-inflammatory M2-like macrophages may be very important in adipose tissue homeostasis. And one of the things that my lab has been interested in is actually their role in iron handling in the adipose tissue because adipocyte iron overload also can lead to insulin resistance of the adipose tissue. And so we are very interested in whether these macrophages and their ability to properly deal with any excess iron in the tissue could be protective against adipocyte iron overload. And, and that concept could really go beyond just the adipose tissue, but also my microglial iron handling in the brain and even macrophage iron handling in, in muscle or liver. So that's one of the things that we're interested in and, and why the, the um, macrophage polarization may be important in these tissues is not just because of their inflammatory status, but because of the, their ability to either sequester or recycle iron. So that's one of the things that we're interested in. Can I ask Alyssa a question? Uh, because as you said earlier, and I would agree that if, if you look at ferritin and iron, uh, there are a lot of studies that show that it tends to be increased in diabetics. Uh, there are studies showing it's correlated with cardiovascular disease, it correlates with insulin resistance. Uh, you know, it, 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 it can generate free radicals, uh, but the concept that iron could be playing an important role in type two diabetes I would say, at least in the clinical world, really hasn't caught on. Why, why do you think that's the case? I, I've asked myself that question as well, especially given that iron overload of beta cells can induce beta cell death, which is what you pointed out as being very important. And because iron is very tightly associated with inflammation, both systemically and locally, I, I'm also puzzled why it really hasn't taken on. There's evidence that people who give blood regularly have reduced incidence of insulin resistance and diabetes. There's evidence that iron chelation can reduce diabetes symptoms. So I, I'm not sure why it hasn't taken on a little bit more interest in the field. It, it puzzles me as well. I, I think that if we had an easy way, a, a therapeutic intervention mm -hmm. that was simple, uh, mm -hmm. that it could be done in sort of run-of-the-mill type 2 diabetics, uh, that might go a long way to actually either proving or disproving or showing the importance, is it big, small, intermediate uh, of iron in terms of, as you said, beta cell function, insulin resistance, inflammation as well. Sure. And it, it's, not, it's not an easy thing if you look at systemic ferritin. It's not telling you much of a picture, right? It's not telling you what, what cells are iron overloaded and how potentially to treat them and how to, how to get them un-iron overloaded, if you will. There's a, there are a lot of unknown questions that just looking at biomarkers can't help us answer. And it's important to know the mechanism and the reason for that iron overload in order to properly target it for a treatment. Yeah because it's also an acute phase reactant, which is a little mm -hmm. bit of a problem, and you'd have to be doing tissue biopsies to actually looking at intracellular uh, iron. But yeah. still, I think that we should, somehow we, we need to get a real better handle on yeah. how clinically important is this in sort of the typical type two diabetics. I think it's a study longing to be done. Yeah. I think some imaging techniques would also would lend themselves to de detecting tissue iron levels as well. So Ralph, there's a question here that came in. It says that since pioglitazone, 
you have indicated is the only medicine which will affect insulin resistance in the liver. Does that mean that other med medications that cause weight loss will not help with NASH or NAFLD? No, I, I think that, and this comes back to what Jerry said, I think that anything that gets fat out of the liver will work. So the best thing is just lose weight, uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist. I mean, I think there's some controversy as to whether there are GLP-1 receptors in the liver and whether the direct effects on the liver, but for sure, you lose, you know, seven to 10% of your body weight. And all of the studies now with the GLP-1 receptor agonists show that there's a decrease in liver fat. Uh, and uh, there are ongoing studies with liver biopsies uh, to show that you can or cannot decrease uh, uh, fibrosis. But uh, in terms of uh, established studies, you know, the first study is Ken Cousy's study and our study that was published in the New England Journal, uh, actually uh, by someone who's at Yale now, Dr. Belford is the first uh, author on that paper. And then Ken did the follow-up paper, though extending it for a year and a half. Pioglitazone really works. It, it decreases you know, inflammation, uh, uh, necrosis, uh, ballooning cells, uh, and uh, uh, actually decreased scarring in uh, fibrosis. But I don't think that there's anything magical about this. It comes back to what Jerry said. This is fat overload. And in the liver, it presents as NAFLD and NASH. In the muscle, as insulin resistance. In the arteries, as premature uh, accelerated coronary artery disease. In the beta cells, as accelerated beta cell uh, failure. I, I think this is all part and parcel of the same syndrome. And, uh, and I think Jerry and I think very similar on this. And he's nodding in agreement. What about the, uh, the gut? Uh, how does the gut play a role in gut hormones in, in, uh, in, in the whole spectrum of things here? Well, I think if you uh, don't make GLP-1 or GIP, or if your beta cells are resistant to GLP-1 and GIP, I think you're in trouble because you're going to get a major defect in the ability of your beta cells uh, to secrete uh, insulin. And there are probably a whole host of other gut hormones that we have yet to identify, which are playing a very important role here. The other issue has to do, uh, and Jerry or Alyssa may want to comment on this, is the, the, the microbiome. You know, uh, you know, when I did the ominous octet, you know, everybody comes up and adds nine, 10, et cetera. Uh, and someone came up with the egregious 11 and 11 is the microbiome. Uh, again, I think if you do studies in rodents, it's pretty easy to show that the microbiome plays an important role in the development of obesity and insulin resistance. Uh, I'm not convinced that there are good studies in humans that on a long-term basis that altering the gut microbiome is going to be protection against weight gain uh, and or protection against diabetes. And I'm not saying that there's not a role. I'm just saying I'm not convinced by the body of evidence in humans uh, that there's a role for the, the gut microbiome. And maybe one of our other panelists want to comment uh, on this. Anybody feel otherwise? If not, we now are at the end of our allotted time. And so I will throw it back to uh, Thomas and Zan and thank our panelists for taking the time to be with us, Jerry, Alyssa, and Ralph. And uh, I really enjoyed the discussions. So I'll say goodbye and turn it back to Thomas and Zan.